Hey, it's Jordan. I'm here with Aaron Mate. You have been uh, a great progressive journalist, uh, fiercely independent. Uh, you've been with The Real News, Democracy Now!, uh, you write for The Nation. And uh, honestly, full disclosure, I like to be honest at the beginning of interviews, I know like maybe a quarter of the Russiagate stuff compared to you. Y you seem to like live it, breathe it, and debunk the majority of it. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to interview you both for the audience and myself because I cover more domestic stuff and I haven't been focused as much on as the Kremlin turns. But I'm told... You cover, you, you cover more important stuff. I mean, really, like, like, like domestic means really actual important issues, not right. this distraction. But I've taken up the role of sort of debunking this distraction because otherwise, you know, there's not there hasn't been too many people to do it. Right. No, I think it is important to debunk it because honestly, this distraction is essentially, in my view, being served as a propaganda tool. But let's focus this week. So I'm told, the, you know, the caves are, are the walls are closing in now. On, on Donald Trump. And as a full disclaimer, like, I, I'm open. I don't like Donald Trump. I'm not defending Donald Trump. To me, it's clear he's had financial dealings with Russia uh, dating back to the 1980s. I mean, that's just public knowledge. But I look at Michael Cohen uh, and his three-year sentence. Unless I'm missing something, I don't, I don't understand why the walls are... The walls could be caving in potentially because of a campaign finance violation. But as far as I could see, what does this have to do with Russia? Yeah, you know, and by the way, even on the campaign finance thing, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm not even so convinced. Like, what I just foresee is this endless kind of legal battle playing out, like similar to what we saw with Lewinsky. And they're going to try, I mean, you know, can they even indict a president, a sitting president? Um, can they prove that this payment to these uh, women was done for the sole benefit of his campaign. And I'm just like seeing already this like nightmare where a lot of people are going to be convinced that this is going to bring Trump down. I'm not so confident, but we'll see. At least in that case, as you indicate, Jordan, at least in that case, prosecutors have something. They have now two cooperating, cooperating witnesses. They have Cohen and uh, the publisher of the National Enquirer. So they have something. But compare that to what they have in the Russia case, which has been our chief political focus of the past two years and has led everyone to be convinced um, or most people to be convinced that Trump is going down for a conspiracy with the Russian government. And the story is, is far different. They There's really, as has been the case for since the beginning, there's a lot of circumstantial uh, um, um, evidence, I guess, or there, there's a lot of like contacts with people who hold Russian passports. But in terms of what's actually there, there's nothing – there's no allegation of a conspiracy with the Russian government today, and there's no even claim or evidence on Mueller's part of a conspiracy. Well, when I point that out, uh, I'm told, you know, the investigation's not over, and Mueller, he might have a smoking gun, and who knows, maybe he might. But I guess what I've argued is, all right, it, maybe Russia did try to infiltrate Trump's campaign. Maybe they have reached out to the Trump campaign. Frankly, I think you could probably find evidence of Saudi Arabia reaching out to candidates in the past, of Israel uh, overwhelmingly reaching out to certain candidates. Um, so even if Russians, you know, CNN and the Washington Post had this big thing, like 15 or 16, they spoke of uh, Trump campaign officials spoke with Russians, like, okay, if you want to say that's uh, uh, raises eyebrows, so be it. But what does that have to do with collusion? Because I could tell you, Aaron, when I was at the Young Turks, I was at the, I was at the debates uh, covering it, and the original charge of collusion that was being rammed down my throat was that the Trump campaign knowingly worked with Russian government officials to distribute hacked emails. And that has really evolved into a much, I would say, downgraded definition of what collusion is. Exactly. If you read that Washington Post article that you referenced, there's even a, a line in there where it the quietly says that Mueller has not yet shown any specific coordination between uh, the Trump campaign and the Russian government. So then what we have now is we're looking at any time a Russian official or even someone like vaguely in the Trump orbit – sorry, uh, any time a Trump official – or anyone in the Trump orbit speaks to a just not even a Russian government official, but like somebody with a Russian passport, 
that's deemed suspicious now, and it's worthy of a big article in the Washington Post, and it's worthy of many resistance types to share on Twitter and as if this is damning. Well, it's only damning if you're a xenophobe, if, if you view speaking to a Russian a, a, as somewhat uh, worthy of suspicion. I mean, like, the fact is that lobbying and just interactions take place all the time. And in all these interactions and for all the uh, documents that have been produced, uh, conversations that have been wiretapped, like, for example, Flynn, Michael Flynn speaking to the Russian ambassador, there's been nothing damning, nothing uh, uh, showing uh, this conspiracy that we're all supposed to be so convinced of, and that has been the chief focus of the past two years. And you know, it's interesting. Like, take Michael Cohen for example. So in his case, he's been indicted for lying to Congress in the uh, in the Russia probe. So the the Russia component of his uh, three year sentence is two months in prison. He he got two months in prison of his out of his three years because he lied to Congress about what. He lied to Congress about uh, the Trump organization's efforts to build a Trump Tower in Moscow, okay? But the inconvenient fact for the collusion hopeful is that the deal went nowhere. It never got off the ground. Mueller even says that it likely required Russian government assistance. He doesn't say, though, that it got Russian government assistance because it didn't. The only assistance that the Trump campaign, that Trump organization got from Russia was literally a phone call from an assistant. The assistant to the Kremlin spokesperson called Michael Cohen back after he emailed a general email, uh, uh, inbox uh, at the Russian office and told him, yeah, we don't help build buildings, but we have a, a, a big economic forum coming up, uh, coming up in June if you want to attend that. That was the extent of Trump and Russian government contact. So it was an assistant calling Cohen back and uh, a deal ultimately going nowhere. Never had Russian government approval, never even came close to getting contact. The farthest it got, aside from that phone call with an assistant, was that Trump signed a letter of intent with what Cohen himself, in an uh, email to his colleague or a message to his colleague, called a third-tier development bank uh, in, in Russia. So yes, Cohen lied about that. And, you know, it looks bad on Cohen. Uh, and it's bad news for him. But, uh, and... Because Cohen lies about something doesn't mean he's covering up a plot. It may just mean he was scared about the Russia investigation. He wanted to protect his boss, be loyal to him. So he just, you know, uh, he so he lied uh, or he misled Congress. Because, by the way, he didn't completely conceal the project. He told them that he, he told them about what was happening. He gave over documents. He even told them that he talked to Trump about it three times. Now, what what, what I'm getting at here is that it's interesting. So Mueller accuses Cohen about lying about that. But. He does not accuse uh, Cohen of lying about something much more important. Cohen also told Congress in, in the same series of statements that he made to them that he did not witness, witness quote, any form of Russian collusion. He also denied to Congress that uh, this allegation in the Steele dossier, the Democratic-funded opposition research, that he went to Prague as part of the uh, conspiracy. So he denied witnessing any form of collusion, and he also denied going to Prague. Now, notice how Mueller is not indicting him for lying about that. So if he's lying, if he if he's indicting him for lying about a deal that went nowhere, but he's not indicting him for lying when he tells, tells Congress he never saw any form of collusion, what does that tell us about the prospects that Cohen is going to blow the whistle on some form of collusion here? All right. And I think there's something important because, like, okay, I think we both agree that collusion and this ridiculous term actually has very much evolved. But even if you wanted to be a devil's advocate and say, OK, he was trying Trump during the campaign was trying to get a very lucrative Moscow Trump Tower built. Uh, there was conversations between Cohen and intermediaries, obviously, and they were trying all the way, uh, I think, around the Republican National Convention or maybe after. OK, um, if that actually if if the tower actually. Oh, excuse me. And during the campaign. Trump was uh, saying things that, you know, like maybe I'll pull out of NATO, NATO. Uh, we need we need to have better relations with Russia. The talk was definitely more friendly towards Russia while they were trying to get this deal. But I never hear in corporate media as he's become president, he's done things that I don't agree with, but actually are not pro Russia. He's armed the Ukrainians. He bombed Syria, which is basically like a strike against Russia. Multiple times he's bombed Syria. Uh, he's done things that, you know, 
corporate media doesn't understand nuance were actually actions that are anti-Russian, but corporate media fixates on the fact that in Helsin- Helsin- Helsinki, he stood up and basically, you know, kissed um, Vladimir Putin. What I don't understand is how, how could you show that there's cause and effect between that Trump Tower uh, and, and him trying to build that with his actual actions as president? Yes, I think you're pointing to something important, and I've been saying this for a while, too. I think it definitely uh, – sed- the fact that Trump was praising Russia on the campaign trail while his organization was, was trying to build something there shows a conflict of interest and shows that Trump is shady. Well, I mean, or at least it shows that he, insofar as he knew about this and was involved in it, that he's, that he's being shady here. I think it's quite likely that that may have motivated his, his warm talk about Russia because he's trying to make a deal there. It shows that he's corrupt. Well, that's not breaking news and it's not – and the question is whether it's worthy of uh, a two-year obsession and being convinced that he's conspiring with the Russian government, which is far different than just being a self-interested, uh, you know, corrupt mogul, which we already know that he is. And uh, and yes, and so since coming to office, when he's in office, it's his policies that really matter, and and, and that's what we should be most concerned about. And yes, this attempt to paint him as an agent of Russia has taken our eye off the fact that his po- his policies, as you say, have been much more hawkish on Russia than Obama was. I mean, all, those, all the examples you mentioned and many more. He uh, pulled out of the INF, this vital uh, nuclear treaty, which um, <laughs> which makes the world a much more dangerous place, but w- which we don't really talk about because it doesn't go with the narrative that we're supposed to believe that, that Trump is serving Russia's interests. And uh, other other things I wanted to ask you about, because to me, the only thing that even is somewhat linked that you might raise your eyebrows and be like, OK, maybe there is something to this WikiLeaks thing is Roger Stone and Jerome Corsi, because, you know, Roger Stone telegraphed during the campaign, like, you know, Podesta's day, day in the barrel is coming and these kinds of things. But to me, that's really the only thing that I'm aware of. And I don't pay attention to it as much as you that it doesn't prove anything yet unless Mueller has something we don't know about. But Roger Stone, even though he wasn't officially with the campaign, was in the background still kind of with the campaign. And how did he know these things? So can you enlighten us? Because maybe I'm wrong, but that's the only thing I even kind of think is questionable. OK. <laughs> and, and, by the, and by the way, I totally want to be enlightened because I don't know. No, I, know I know. Listen, I'm smiling because Roger Stone is such a troll. And he's, he's a clown, and he's convinced everyone uh, that he has some back channel to WikiLeaks. When, I mean, if you think about it, like, is, like, do you think WikiLeaks, you know, given all that it does, would, I mean, does it make sense that they're, that they're, that they would be trusting secrets with Roger Stone, who's like a, a prominent conspiracy theorist, who's, who blurts everything out, who says, who's constantly in the media, loves attention? Is WikiLeaks going to use him if, and say if they're in some kind of like conspiracy with Trump? Are they going to use him as their intermediary? And is their intermediary going to be broadcasting on Twitter everything he's been told by WikiLeaks? I mean, so it just like even without looking at the details, it just like the idea to me is so um, far fetched. Now, look, Ro- Ro- what Roger Stone did, according to Julian Assange, is he trolled everyone. He he talked about having dinner with Assange when they never did. They never met. Uh, Roger Stone did communicate with this guy, Randy Credico, who's a comedian who hosts a public radio show on WBAI. And Credico, I think, spoke to someone who was on Assange's legal team and may have heard something and may have told Roger Stone something. But I'm not even convinced of that. What I do know is that um, before Roger Stone did that tweet about Podesta's time in the barrel, there were already articles. There was one in Breitbart talking about how Podesta was going to be in trouble as a result of Manafort being in trouble because Manafort had had been outed or had been talked about now publicly for his shady work in Ukraine. And so Roger Stone, who was who previously worked with Manafort and was friendly with some of Manafort's friends, I think when he talked about Podesta's time in the barrel, I think that's what was going on there. He was based going off a Breitbart report. And one indication of the fact that there might not be nothing there between Roger Stone and WikiLeaks is that the only communication that has emerged publicly between WikiLeaks and Roger Stone is of WikiLeaks imploring Roger Stone. I'm paraphrasing here. I don't remember the exact quote, but like sometime after the election to like to stop making false claims 
about us having any ties. So that was in like a Twitter DM. So, you know, that's that's the Roger Stone thing. Um, and it, it's to me, it's symbolic that like a far right conspiracy theorist, him uh, and Jerome Corsi can come to play such prominent roles in what ultimately is a conspiracy theory, this idea that Trump, Russia and WikiLeaks were all in cahoots. There's a certain symbolism there. And also, there's an element about WikiLeaks that I don't, I mean, you're never going to hear this in corporate media because nuance isn't a thing. But everything I know about WikiLeaks is they don't always know who their source is. There's a lot of times that they don't know who the original source is. And sometimes that's intentional. So it's possible, even if I don't, I actually still have not seen any incontrovertible keyword, incontrovertible proof or any forensic details that the Russian government hacked. But putting that aside, um, there's no direct proof that Julian Assange uh, knew it was from a foreign government. And based on what I know about WikiLeaks, if I don't really think they would be using the Russian government as a source. Well, what are your thoughts on all that? You know, let me just say, if I had to bet right now, I actually would bet, not with full confidence, but I would bet that it was the Russian government or a Russian government related actor that did hack the emails. Because, the, you know, Mueller's indictment of the uh, Russian intelligence officers is really specific. Like, and it just, you know, unless he is, he was, he's using intelligence that is just wildly off the mark. It just seems crazy to me that given, just given the amount of people who would be involved in, in that indictment, it just seems implausible to me that they could get it so wrong. I don't think that they would lie about it, but I, I do think that they, they're, that, the only possibility to me is that the intelligence they're using is totally wrong, which is still possible. I mean, like we know that happens, but well, just not, just just a disclaimer: Robert Mueller sat in front of Congress and talked about weapons of mass destruction. Go on. That is true. That is very true. So listen, anything's possible. Yeah. I'm just saying, if, if I had to bet, if I had to bet, I I just find it so, you know, and, and of course I you know like these things that happen where certainly government officials will just lie through their teeth as as Mueller certainly gave testimony that was not that was false whether he knew he was lying or not you know he he went along with the WMD hoax so maybe he's going along with something that's not that's not accurate here but you know I'm just saying is uh, but um what's also po I mean and then if you get technical what Julian Assange has suggested is that actually there was some Russian government hacking of something but that hacking might not have been of the actual emails themselves that WikiLeaks released. So what could be happening is that the U.S. government, in accusing the Russian government of of hacking the emails, is conflating that with a different hacking operation. You know, and just you know, and um, so who knows? I mean, uh, hopefully we'll get more information. Although it's unlikely because it's not like these Russian intelligence operatives will be going to court. Um, and I'm certainly not saying that we should just believe the u.s government because they allege it I, i'm just saying that it just the, the 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 specificity leads me to believe that there is at least something there mm -hmm. and what, what's interesting to me is you know cable news i used to work at msnbc for a dark time in my life i also worked at fox and cable news is frankly an older audience and it's very clear to me there's a reason that they're hysterical about russia because their mm -hmm. audience came up during the Cold War, for the most part, and invoking and reinvoking this great, like, Rocky Four esque plot um, is good for ratings. I mean, Rachel Maddow has had her best ratings ever over the last two years. Uh, same thing uh, for CNN. And they've really taken very little breaks uh, as far as Russiagate, other than the Kavanaugh that whole month and some other things. This has been continual. And the reason I'm bringing that up is if you actually look at the actual. Um, finances, Trump's uh, Trump organization, Trump foundation. To me, if you were just a journalist looking for corruption or any criminal collusion, Saudi Arabia would be the first thing you look at when it comes to the Trump uh, business. Uh, of course, they do have, they have had dealings with Russia and this and that, but it seems to me uh, Saudi Arabia, I mean, just look currently, the amount of Saudi Arabian uh, officials that stay in the Washington DC Trump Tower. Uh, basically, I think at a discount, I don't even know. So the point is, it seems like they're less interested in actually investigating Trump's criminal or collusion uh, with foreign governments for his own benefit. They're more interested in, in f making it a Russia criminal 
conspiracy. Yeah, I mean, making it about Russia serves many uh, purposes. And unfortunately, like too many privileged people are in too much of a position to benefit if the focus is only on Russia. So if it's only on Russia, then we also ignore – we not only ignore Saudi Arabia – uh, but we also ignore, uh, for example, the Trump campaign's deep ties to to Israel. I mean, even to the point where Israel asked the, the tr- incoming Trump transition team to sabotage Obama at the UN on his way out, and Trump tried. They tried, but they failed. And by the way, they tr- they tried to they tr- they asked Russia to do it, to go along with them, and Russia turned them down. Um, and the reason why why this is why it's convenient to ignore Israel and Saudi Arabia is because the because there's a bipartisan political consensus that has been deeply entrenched with both. So I mean, whether it's a Republican or Democratic president, uh, the U.S. policy is, is to support these allies. I mean, I've, after all, you know well, Jordan, it was Obama who gave the green light to Saudi's war on Yemen. So, Saudi Arabia literally asked Obama for for approval. And uh, they gave it. And I don't think Saudi Arabia would have carried out this war without it. And despite now hearing from Obama officials that they're against the war, when they were in power, they did everything they could to, to keep it going with a couple of exceptions. They scaled back some weapons sales. But ultimately, the decisive military and, and diplomatic support continued. So focusing on Russia, uh, it is a great way for, for U.S. elites to – uh, deflect from their own complicity uh, with with other foreign governments who are not good for the for either democracy here or or human rights around the world. Um, it also, you know, but and also, but whether it's even now, like we're seeing some focus on Saudi Arabia in in the corporate media, but even then, I'd I'd be careful with it because a they are – it's being portrayed as if it's like a Trump-specific problem, not a Washington problem. And the only reason it's even we're even allowed to look at it skeptically now is, is because Saudi Arabia killed Jamal Khashoggi, who's considered a part of the club. He's a, considered a part of the elite club. He wrote for the Washington Post. And he actually was strongly allied with different parts of the Saudi ruling family. So now Saudi Arabia is 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 open to scrutiny. But they haven't been open to scrutiny throughout this past three years of, of destroying Yemen until now. Um, and, and, as, and, and as you point out, I mean, I just did a video on this Center for American Progress, you know, that bastion of progressiveness. Yeah. Uh, they take money from Saudi Arabia. Most of these think tanks, uh, progressive, conservative, take money from Saudi Arabia. And a lot of these politicians uh, are, are somewhat uh, indirectly or directly taking money from Saudi Arabia. Exactly. Exactly right. And the through line for all this, whether we're looking at like Saudi oligarchs or Russian oligarchs or whoever, all of this no matter who it is, it has the impact of taking our eyes off American oligarchs, you know, and um, taking our eye off of issues that actually impact working people in this country. So, you know, it's like imagine right now how far we are off from like what's happening in France, where you have a, a loose coalition of, of people, many of them working people, some of them right wing, some of them with views that I, I personally don't like, but a lot of people also with progressive values fighting for real issues uh, Fighting taxes and um, uh, calling for an end to neoliberal economics, but we don't have anything approaching that here, in part because our media wants us focused on external issues like Russia, and maybe sometimes now we can talk about Saudi Arabia. But all of this also has the added benefit for elites of taking our eye off of what is being done in this country. So the further decimation of of Obamacare, the fact we don't have healthcare really, like a like a like a civilized healthcare program, the tax heist. Uh, the the largest upward transfer of wealth pretty much in U.S. history. I mean, consider the fact that the day after Jeff Sessions was fired, there were bigger protests over that, over Sessions firing across the country than there was over the fact that the, the Republican Congress passed this tax heist that literally robbed everybody and gave to the rich. I mean, it's mind blowing. And consider that we're living in times when progressives were actually pissed off that Jeff Sessions got fired. I mean, that's yeah. warped in itself. But yeah. you bring up a good point. I, I want to ask you more about the psychology because let's throw it all out for a second and say it's all fucking true. Tr- you know, there, we end up having proof that the Trump <laughs> campaign worked with the Russian government and they were downing vodka, you know, as WikiLeaks <laughs> was releasing that. Let's say that's true. OK, to me, that would be a massive, massive scandal if, if it were true. But that's, you know, I even had... Uh, a f- friendly argument when I was at the Young Turks in a segment with Jenk 
when they say, you know, it swung the election. Well, I could tell you because I was in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Ohio, and I saw up close, I mean, I don't think there's any empirical data, any, including exit polls, that indicate uh, any of the people, I don't want to say any, but the, major- the majority of the people in those states have voted based on what, what, what was released at WikiLeaks or, you know, anti-Russia phobia or, oh, I suddenly, you know, realize Hillary Clinton is kind of a, a phony baloney politician. It, it seems like there's this real desire among the corporate media and the politicians to have, a, have, a, have an out for why neoliberalism lost to this orange orangutan. And by the way, I think, I think pretty much, I don't want to say anyone, but I think Trump would have lost to a more progressive candidate because more progressive, I mean, pr- Trump's policies that he proposed uh, on the, in the campaign, many of them actually were not so far off from Bernie Sanders, you know, uh, NAFTA being bad. He, I always say he had Ohio and Michigan at NAFTA because I saw it. it. They were like hyenas at, at his rallies when he said he's getting rid of NAFTA and I'm bringing the jobs back. So I guess what I'm getting at, sorry I'm long-winded, is it seems to me that there's really a desire just to prove that this is why Trump got elected when there's no actual data to prove that. Uh, of course, it's it's been so obvious from the beginning that that's why we're supposed to talk about Russia is because uh, these neoliberal Democrats who lost to one of the worst, if not the worst, presidential candidates in history. I mean, literally someone who's a reality TV show host. Uh, they, they need an excuse. And, um, you know, we're supposed to believe that these Russian ads on Facebook that no one saw, that weren't even about the election, that mostly aired not even before the election, but after the election, somehow influenced people. Um, you know, if you ask, like, what, what emails that were released do you think influenced a single voter? There was, okay, so the email showed that the, the DNC was was biased against Bernie. Uh, and they also showed that Hillary Clinton said different things privately to Wall Street than she said in public. Okay, do you think that convinced, you know, um, tens of thousands of people in the, in the key swing states to vote for Trump instead? And, and by the way, all this ignores the many, many people who just stayed home because they didn't like any, they didn't like either candidate. And unfortunately, as you indicate, Jordan, like what, what happened in 2016 is we had two major candidates who are speaking to the concerns of workers. Unfortunately, the candidate who was lying about it and had no intention of doing anything for workers is the candidate who who uh, who won. And and the and the candidate who didn't make it out of the primary, Bernie Sanders, unfortunately, he meant it, but he he didn't get a chance to to face off against Trump. And so in the general we have Trump who actually at least was saying things even though it was a con about American workers and about their, their their concerns. You have Hillary Clinton basically saying that America is already great and, and things are perfect. Um, so, you know, people made their choice. And, and it's obvious then why the Democrats who lost to Trump need to find a scapegoat. Uh, and it's all become, it becomes this covert plot, even though, even if the plot is true, even if Russia did steal those emails, no one can really talk about how they think that that was decisive enough to convince enough voters. And really, the whole thing shows is contempt for voters, right? I mean, like, it, 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 it's this idea that the voters are so, are so malleable that some reading about some emails in a newspaper or going to the WikiLeaks website is going to convince them to vote for Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. Like, it, it sort of assumes them to be sort of like tools and, and, and being prone, prone to manipulation. The whole, the whole thing reveals... On top of the fact that they want us to believe that there was a conspiracy between Trump and Russia, the fact that they think that like that like uh, they see American voters as such dupes, it, it, like it reveals a real contempt. And that contempt, by the way, I think helps explain why they lost. And you know, uh, what's interesting is obviously neither of us were around during the McCarthy times, but I, I'm hearing like I, I was I was watching Ted Lieu, a congressman on CNN. And he's talking about, you know, fears of people being brainwashed now through Facebook and things like that. And I'm just watching it and thinking to myself, like, have these people not seen the Internet for the past 10 to 15 years? Like before Facebook, like they're making it. It's it's very I don't even know if it's McCarthyite, but it's a very like hysterical, very um, vague thing that like foreign governments like Russia, trolls, whatever, are brainwashing people and we need to protect 
consumers against this propaganda, but like there's things like Correct the Record that exist. There's things like the Coke industries that have paid trolls and things like that. So it just doesn't make sense to me. I, I, I don't really trust the motives of these people, but you know, yes, there are a lot of impressionable, pe impressionable people on the internet, but I don't really think we're at great length to this unprecedented brainwashing at the hands of Russia or any other foreign government, to tell you the truth. I think we're being brainwashed, frankly, by Anderson Cooper and Morning Joe. You know, somebody tweeted at me the other day, and I want to read it to you. And this person is a – he writes for Wired magazine, and he's a former um, head of some sort of operation at MIT. And he wrote – and he's talking about the Russians. He goes, they hacked our heads by giving us what we wanted. They knew us better than we knew ourselves, or at least were more cynical about our debased intellectual and political state. So there's really this widespread idea that these Russian master manipulators literally hacked our heads is that they have psychic powers and were able to, because of their profound psychological insights, turn us against ourselves. I mean, it's like, this is a really common narrative and it's weird. I, you know what, when I get stuff like that, I mean, and I don't want to single him out because it's, as you, you know, with Ted Lieu, for example, it's very prevalent. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's one headline, I think, in Time magazine, like someone like how, how Putin can how Putin controlled the American mind or something like that. So this is maybe very common. It's totally McCarthyite. It's science fiction. And it's weird. And, and the like what people don't realize that it's a giant case of projection. This Russian, this alleged Russian psyop that we're all supposed to be scared about. We're really doing it to ourselves. We've convinced ourselves, I think, because, I mean, from different reasons, but I think the main one is that Trump winning an election and being our president is weird and it's traumatizing, understandably. So when traumatic events happen, we need something to comfort ourselves and make and explain this like this this really like dystopic and just disturbing reality we're in. And so this idea then that it's all the because these Russian Svengali's manipulated us is convenient. But I mean, we're all grown adults. And it's the fact that this this belief is is so widespread. It's it, it's hard, and so for those of us who don't go along with it, it's weird because we you know we have to be respectful of people because people are coming from a, a pained place, and they're obviously upset by the fact that Trump is the president, and they're they're legitimately scared. I think of a Russian operation. So it's like it, it's hard to go about it though without mocking it because it's so silly. Right. And, you know, I want to ask you, uh, obviously, you don't, you don't have to name names, but I will. Um, I think ind some independent outlets have also become part of this, too. I mean, I publicly said when I was at the Young Turks, enough. <laughs> like, I, 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 ha I'm, I'm, I appreciate that they invested and sent me out on real stories. But when I was there and definitely since I've left, it's, it's pretty much I don't really watch it a lot, but from what I, what I hear and what I see in clips online, it, it's pretty much 60, 70% of what they cover. I've even seen Democracy Now! I've seen some clips um, that kind of are not so much different from what, what I'm seeing on CNN. Uh, it's okay for you know even independent outlets to disagree on things, but it seems to me that independent outlets are at the expense of the stories that viewers depend on independent outlets to cover, you know, water contamination or the minimum wage fights, police brutality, I could go on. There, those things are kind of flying by the wayside more to cover this at a bit of a hysterical level. I'm not asking you to attack anyone in particular, but do, do you think that this is kind of dripping a little too far out into our own medium? Because independent media is a small, small little room. Uh, so. People depend on the, the outlets that they knew to cover different things and cover them more accurately without the corporate spin uh, to do it. I'm happy to criticize some of our independent media colleagues who I think have totally dropped the ball on this, as you say. Um, you know, in the Young Turks defense, they do still have Jimmy Dore there uh, on his channel. And, you know, they haven't censored him, which I'm very thankful for because Jimmy from the beginning is – has voiced, you know, skepticism about this, and has featured voices like me and you who do. Um, so that's good for the Young Turks that they don't. But yes, when I tune into the Young Turks, sometimes I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's like, it's so credulous, and they don't, they don't know the basic facts of the case, and they're going along with the 
manipulation or the disregard of the actual facts that everyone else is doing. I can say the same thing about my old home, Democracy Now! I was there for 10 years. I learned so much there about the importance of skepticism and challenging government claims. Like so many times when I was credulous um, about certain stories or I, I bought things, like I would see Amy Goodman uh, push back on them and she was right, you know? And I mean, she sort of helped set the standard for how to be like a noble reporter. So, I mean, I don't know what exactly is going on there, but I think they've really abandoned the the principles that 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 have that 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 make democracy now what it is on this one story i mean like that's really you know like i there it, like dn is still great but on this one story i've just been shocked to see some of the things i've seen like you have guests coming on asserting the fact that there's a conspiracy between trump and russia asserting that as fact without even being challenged you know you've had some weird comments about trump being promoted by soviet propaganda outlets and um uh, I remember there was one segment even before the election. I couldn't believe it. I wrote them. I was like, guys, what's going on? It was like it was about how Trump's ties to Russia could threaten national security. That was the headline of the segment. This was even before the election. So, you know, again, I, like I, I think there's a general trend that because Russia Gate is seen as being something that threatens Trump, there's sort of a, a pressure to go along with it. But really. In the process, I mean, not only is journalistically does it not, I think, stand up to uh, scrutiny when you look at the actual facts, but also ultimately, I think Russiagate helps Trump because look at what it's done. As we talked about before, tens of thousands of people marching because Jeff Sessions gets fired because he's no longer there to protect the Russia investigation. No, no, no march is nearly as big over the biggest tax heist in U.S. history. The decimation of Obamacare. I mean, every you know, you know, Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords. So, meanwhile, as we're all focused on Russia Gate and thinking that, that a conspiracy is going to bring Trump down, Trump and the Republican agenda is is continuing pretty much unimpeded, or at least with way less resistance than it could have otherwise. And and the last outlet I'll say is the Intercept, um, which to me has also helped set the standard for noble reporting, and especially you know its brand is sort of being adversarial. And challenging government claims. Well, now, I mean, it's like you know, Glenn Greenwald pretty much single-handedly has been a um, you know a Russia gay skeptic there and has done great stuff. But now they have Jim Risen writing factually incorrect columns. The other day, I just I pointed out that he literally just copied Mueller's words verbatim and didn't even quote them. Just he just like reproduced them, which they then corrected. Uh, they had this big story. Uh, in 2017 about uh, Russia allegedly hacking into voting systems. Um, they didn't look at the actual document, really, I think seriously, upon which their story was based, which showed that the NSA, which they were citing, wasn't even actually confident that Russia did anything. It was based on one analyst's judgment. And even there, that analyst attribution was based on uh, contextual information, nothing, no confirmed intelligence. And when I pointed this, this out to Jim, to Jim Risen in an interview on the Real News, he couldn't back up anything he was saying, anything the article said, and he eventually hung up on the interview. Uh, and um, so it's been sad to see some of our colleagues and people who I really admire go along with it. And it has to do with many factors, you know. But I, I think I, I would guess the most dominant one is that on the surface they think they're being anti-Trump, but really. If you look at the evidence, if the evidence isn't there, then I don't see how that is being anti-Trump. And also, if you look at the impact where we're taking our eye off Trump's agenda, I don't see how you can say that they're doing something that is going to bring Trump down. Well, I also think it's kind of um, it's kind of uh, dangerous because at the same time, it's OK. Like, it's OK if, for example, when I worked at the Young Turks, it's OK if we disagree on some issues, but you, you the point of independent media is we're going to disagree based on having facts, correct, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I yeah. think like you said, and because you kind of really, really have well-researched every drip, drip, drip that they put out there, uh, a lot of people are speaking not based on the actual facts, but based on kind of Trump derangement syndrome. And, exactly. And frankly, yeah. I thought Jank had it when I was there, and, and yeah. it's not, I'm not attacking him or them. But the point is, so many people, I see it in the comments all the time. Like when I cover a water contamination story, when I cover, um, I just did an original story on DuPont poisoning North Carolina for 40 years and they're getting off with a $12 million fine. Every single person is like, why isn't anyone else doing this? Why isn't, I'm not saying this because I'm special, 
But really, there's a hunger out there for real news. And for every segment that um, the outlets we're talking about uh, dedicate to basically conjecture and projection, uh, mm -hmm. it takes away from those other things. One more question about the journalistic part. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, we're just having fun fighting on Twitter. But sometimes, it, at least for me, I'd like to know for you, like you're getting pretty, you're getting hit, man, on Twitter constantly. I mean, I watch it. Glenn Greenwald, the same. I mean, beyond, between being an agent of the Kremlin and you're a Trump supporter and I've had people tell me, you know, things about my family. I mean, basically that pain that people feel about Trump being president, they're not looking at what you're tweeting out. They're not looking at what you were reporting when you were at The Real News. It's just like visceral, like you're a Trump supporter, you're an agent of Russia, this and that. As a journalist, uh, now you're kind of independent. I think you recently left The Real News. How, how, how do you deal with that? Are you just immune to it now? Or, you know, I'm assuming it bothers you at some times. It's just Twitter. It's just Twitter. I mean, uh, I think it's really important for anybody using Twitter, any social media, not to take it too seriously. And uh, I mean, I don't want to sound corny, but like, you know, I've been to Gaza, you know what I mean? And I, I've seen I've seen what 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 real um, adversity is. And so, you know, like I just I mean, yeah, if someone calls me a name like there's 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 going to be like you might get some instinctual emotional uh, emotional response coming up. But I mean, who cares? You know, like like. Uh, and it's funny. And honestly, when blue check mark uh, people attack me, uh, like liberals attack me who I don't respect, I, I see I take it as a badge of honor. I mean, I, I think it's wonderful that people who I, I think are either blind to the facts or are advocates for a noxious agenda see me as a danger. And so I I embrace it and I find it actually encouraging. Uh, two more. I should have asked this at the, at the front end because it's the, the latest news. But, uh, you know, they keep talking about this Maria uh, Bettina as, yeah. as a Russian spy. Yeah. Um, but then I read articles saying like, oh, well, that's ultimately they came to the conclusion she wasn't a Russian spy. And she did. Uh, can you sort through fact first? Because like Chris Cuomo, I saw him the other night. He must have you'd be in the hospital the amount of times he said spy if you were doing yeah. a drinking game. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the fact of that case? So. As we're speaking, the plea uh, deal in her case has just come out, uh, and so I've read it quickly. Um, when this case emerged, Bettina was accused of being a spy. She was accused of offering sex uh, in return for uh, for political access to get close to to influential Republicans as part of some Russian plot. Everyone's it's been widely speculated that her case could implicate Trump. Uh, there's been all this speculation about it. And you read her plea deal, and first of all, prosecutors have withdrawn all their uh, most salacious claims. So the thing about sex is gone. And the reason is is because it's very obvious. The sex thing came from her from a joke she made in some in some messages with with a colleague. And uh, the judge in the case said, yeah, within five minutes, I could, I could read them. I could figure it out that she was just joking. But her joke, was fodder for this endless headlines everywhere. I mean, if you search it, like Butina and the word sex, you can see headlines, uh, Russia, uh, alleged Russian spy, a Russian spy offered sex for favors. And so now you read the plea deal today, and basically what it is, it's a, it's a uh, trumped up uh, foreign lobbying case where she failed to register as a foreign agent uh, with the attorney general. Um, nothing to do with spying, nothing to do with espionage. Basically, she was out in the open trying to advance uh, what she saw as Russian interests, uh, going to meetings, arranging meetings, arranging visits by U.S. politicians to Russia. A big concern of hers was guns. She's very, very pro-gun, and so she made ties with the NRA. I mean, obviously, she has views I don't agree with, but out in the open, she was trying to advance her pro-gun Russian agenda. And one indication of the fact that she might not have been in cahoots with the Russian government is that the Russian government is very anti-gun. Her organization is like is like non grata in Russia, because 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 Putin and and the Russian government are, are very like don't want guns there, so which undermines the like the possibility that that she was doing this whole thing and establishing ties with the NRA on the Russian government's behalf. And of course, in the actual plea deal, if you read it, it's basically unregistered foreign lobbying. Um, and it, it even says that she wanted to go. It even accepts that her that that her her studying 
in uh, in the U.S. W- was done out of a genuine interest. She actually wanted to go to grad school here. So it's a case where basically because she has a Russian passport and because some of the people involved are bad guys like the NRA, um, it's been conveniently used as uh, as an example of, of an espionage case when it's not. It's just – it's a Russian national uh, acting as a lobbyist that she could have avoided if she just registered – uh, and by the way, there are many people who pretty much do the exact same thing she does, but will never, ever face a courtroom because they're not Russian. Right. My last question, you know, I'll give you my prediction. I'd like to know yours. Uh, you're already seeing exploratory committees, uh, Julian Castro, he's going to run for president. It's like, a, you know, it's the Republican version on the Democratic side now with like an estimated 25, 30 people possibly running. I think the DNC, the Democratic Party, is going to make this Russia Gate a litmus test. If you're who is more fire breathing <laughs> against <laughs> against Trump uh, on Russia. And if uh, if somebody like a, a Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, a Joe Biden, whomever uh, along those neoliberal lines uh, becomes the nominee, I think they're going to lose to Trump uh, because the bottom line is, I look at data, Hillary Clinton got uh, 5% less African-Americans came out compared to 2012. She got 6% less age 18 to 29 that came out compared to 2012. She got 5% less uh, Latinos that came out. With those three, th- those three groups I routinely interview in the field, obviously not all of them, uh, their main priority is not Russia. And those are who the Democratic Party, uh, in addition to picking back up some of those white working class people, they need very, very high numbers of those groups. And I don't think the Cold War reenactment is going to get it done. And I actually think it's going to galvanize Trump's base and possibly, possibly uh, he could pick up more support. Uh, I guess I'm asking you not to predict the winner, but do you do you see Russiagate becoming a litmus test for, for Democrats? I hope not. <laughs> I hope I hope that Mueller hands in his report soon. Um, if my predictions are correct, there's not going to be a conspiracy, and hopefully Democrats will will take the L and and move on. You know, I really hope they do. Um, I, 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 you know, it's it, it's hard to predict any, anything more than that. I mean, certainly it, this has been their thing, and maybe they can keep it going. But if they do, I certainly agree that they will be at their peril. Right. I appreciate you taking so much time at Aaron Mate on Twitter. Uh, are you doing any videos lately or Aaron J. Uh, Mate, uh, I can't even say my last name. Aaron J. Mate at Twitter. Uh, and uh, right now, I know I'm not doing any videos, but, you know, um, I'm writing and, uh, and hopefully I'll have something else soon. Cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jordan.